it's sort of like when I talk with an athlete or someone who wants to jump up and maybe do a marathon for the first time. Training for a marathon, first of all, anyone can do it. So I <laughs> sometimes when people say like, I can never do that, that's total crap. You right. know, anybody can do it. You just have to put in the work. But you have to get a little bit uncomfortable. If you're lifting, if you are trying to become more powerful, more fit, even if you're trying to lose weight, whatever your goal is when it comes to fitness or with running or whatever it might be, if you want to achieve that new goal, you're going to have to accept that there's going to be a little bit of discomfort. Mm -hmm. This episode of the Smart Athlete Podcast is brought to you by Solpre, skincare for athletes. Whether you're in the gym, on the mats, on the road, or in the pool, we protect your skin so you're more comfortable in your own body. To learn more, go to solpre.com. Welcome to the Smart Athlete Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Funk. My guest today is a former NCAA runner. He has his RCA and USCA certified run coach or certifications. Um, he has his master's in guidance and counseling. He's a professionally certified life and leadership coach. He is the founder of Coaching on the Run and his new project has been live just for a few weeks now, Run to Thrive. You can check that out. He's also a pop culture fan, which we're going to get into that. There's a reason probably that he's that because of his background. He also, and we're definitely touching on this, makes plant-based cheeses at home. Welcome to the show, <laughs> Matt Mills. <laughs> Thanks. It's great to be here. I always like when you kind of give me a, a handful of things to say, it, it just gives, kind of gives me a little way to start the show and be like, all right, let's start, let's start buzzing this off. But also um, it's fun because I get to see and frame, not just for the person listening to us, but in my uh -huh. own mind, like who you are. And, and it kind of gives me a little bit of, um, a nugget, so to speak, on like the journey that you've taken to get here. It's not like you just woke up one day and you're like, I'm going to, I'm going to coach people. Yeah, like <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, there's lots of time and process behind all of those things that I just went through. Yeah. Um, before we get too deep into the running stuff, um, which I'm sure we will, can you give me a little bit of background on on where you came from. So I, I, you know, listened to another podcast you were on. I heard you were in the entertainment industry before you yeah. kind of just switch over to, yep. um, I'll say athletic endeavors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I, and even to back up from there to put in a little bit of running, you know, I've, I've been a lifelong runner, but professionally, and I talked about this, like I I'm a huge pop culture fanatic, love everything, absorb it all, movies, music, TV. And so for me, my dream was always like, when I was a young kid, I was like, I'm going to be Steven Spielberg. I'm going to be a filmmaker. And so I just kind of thought it's a passion of mine. I'm so obsessed with it. So I'm going to make it my career. And I, I was fortunate enough to have the ability to pursue that. Not everybody can. So when I graduated college, moved out to Los Angeles, pursued a career in the entertainment industry. And uh, my older brother had already been established working in it as well. And it was just something where I kind of didn't know specifically what I was going to do in entertainment, but I just knew I loved it and I wanted to be a part of it. And so that was really how I started my career path uh, working in that industry. So what did you end up, I mean, were you doing multiple things yeah. or like what, I mean, kind of what kind of led you through that and then I guess out of the entertainment? Because mm -hmm. as you mentioned, you yep. know, a lot of people think, hey, this is absolutely something, you know, I want to do, myself included, um, but not, not everybody has the opportunity or takes the initiative to yeah. pursue that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I've always kind of been one of those people that's just when I want to pursue a goal, want to pursue a dream, I'm just like, all right, I got to figure it out how that happens. I don't know how I'm going to get there, but I'm going to get there. Mm -hmm. And that was really how I, I started pursuing that career path. Um, you know, I worked for a talent agency and then I worked for a, f a film director, uh, 
and and worked more on the creative development side, which basically all that meant was I was looking for ideas for movies. I was reading a lot of books, reading a lot of comic books, reading a lot of scripts. And, you know, on the outside, it looked like I was living the dream and was having a lot of fun. But really what I started to realize was it was not as fulfilling (laughs) as I thought it was going to be. And I was working really long hours. I was busting my butt doing quote unquote everything right that I thought I had to. And there was just something that was super unfulfilling about it. Not only that, but I saw what my career path was possibly going to be in the future. And it just wasn't something that lit me up. At the same time, I was discovering things that were exciting me and things that were really of, of that were becoming Uh, my passion. And that was actually mentoring, that was teaching, that was coaching others. And actually, it took me seeing a coach to really help point that out. So it was kind of this mix of something didn't feel right with the career path that I was pursuing. And and, and it was really hard for me to, to deal with because it was something that was a lifelong dream. I was like, no, no, this is what I thought I was always going to be doing. There must be something off about this career path that, I, that I'm going after. And uh, when I fortunately discovered something that was really calling me a little bit more loudly, again, that coaching, that teaching, uh, I, helping and, and um, working with others, then I started to really lean into that and um, just follow that thread. And that's something that I, I talk to my clients about is really when you kind of have that inner instincts that 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 sparked something in there that you think might be telling you something you really owe it to yourself to follow it and so that's what I did and it led me to uh, to do a couple of cool things I actually from entertainment I went to Tanzania for a year uh, and taught English um, and then realized I still wanted to continue to pursue teaching coaching and so I just went all in with that and never looked back you know, it, as you're kind of telling your story, it, it, it makes me think about how it's, it had to be a tough situation to be in, right? So as you said, you're, you feel like you're doing everything right and, and you yeah. are doing the thing that you thought you should be doing that, that would bring you that fulfillment, but then it ends up, you know, kind of leaving a hole there. It's, it's not quite, mm-hmm. you know, what you want it to be. It reminds me, um, when I spoke to former professional triathlete Vanessa Raw, she she raced for 10, 15 years professionally, and it was somewhat of a similar situation where like she was very good at the sport. Yeah. And there's tons of work that has to be done to do it, but it was like it, she felt a lot of pressure from other people who were telling her how good she was yep. rather than – That's right feeling that inner fulfillment where like she's, she's an artist by trade and that's what she does now yeah. all the time. It, yeah. and it, it's like, it, that's, it, it's a tough position to be in because the people that are, I guess I'm trying to be empathetic with you because, because the people that yeah. are envious of your position are like, well, Matt, like you have everything I, I could ever want. How are you unhappy? Totally. You know, and that's, that's like, that's this, this compression in, on top of all the, issues you're already feeling, you know, and not feeling fulfilled. For sure. Yeah. And you, you hit on it. It, It's also, you know, sometimes when we hear from other people, when we, when we get that validation or we hear from others, when they're defining what our identity is. And I heard a lot of that too. You know, I was working really hard and moving up in my career pretty fast when I was working in entertainment. And I had a lot of people telling me, oh, you're really talented. You're going to have a really successful career you know you're you're doing a great job and then that becomes you think that that becomes your identity what Mm -hmm. other people are telling you and so i i love that example of of that triathlete is that you almost feel like you are uh betraying Mm -hmm. that identity you feel like oh my gosh this is what everyone else is telling me that i'm really good at so what am i missing right and actually what you you need to ask the other question of like, what is it that I want instead of what is, what does everybody else want for me? 
Um, and that was when I had that switch and started owning more of what was more in alignment with my integrity and what it is that I wanted. It just, it opened up a lot more and it was, that's always the hardest step mm -hmm. is to really acknowledge that it doesn't have to be the way that everyone else thinks it has to be for you. Right. You know, and I, I have to kind of check myself on some of this sometimes because I've always had a lot of little ambitions, like I want to do this or I want to do that or a lot of different interests and hobbies and in various fields. And the truth is you can only be really great at uh, one or two things because you have to specialize. But I, I, when I come with dilemmas like that, it's a little macabre, but I always try to frame it in, in two ways, but predominantly thinking about the, you know, eight year old version of me, like, am I going to be satisfied yeah. if I continue down this path? Am I going to be happy with the thing that I did when I'm, you know, on my deathbed? Am I going to say that was a life well lived? Right. Or did I have, you know, another path, another purpose here on earth, here in this life that I could have pursued that would have brought me greater fulfillment or, mm -hmm. and possibly, uh, or, <laughs> and, and, or, um, you know, impacted more people. Yep. And, and one thing I would, I would add to that is it is okay to change. And, right. and you will, you know, so, you know, I talk a lot about values in my work and how important that is, not just with runners, but with other people who are trying to achieve more of that fulfillment and success in their life. And, you know, you might value something at one point in time, but given whatever circumstances, maybe, you know, you have a family or maybe, you know, you're, you're living in a part of the country or you're, you have a particular job, you know, your value is, is going to change from time to time. There might be times when you value more of that security. Another time you might value wanting to have more of that challenge or that adventure. So I think it's giving yourself permission to know that it, things might change and it's okay for that to happen. Just because that change does happen doesn't mean that you failed in any way. Doesn't mean that something's wrong. Um, but sometimes we think that that's the case because somebody else, we, we look at others or we we're just we're not sure of what the right answer is and not to get like too uh <laughs> kind of philosophical about that this but that's what life is about nobody has the answer nobody knows what's going to happen mm -hmm. in anyone's life in five to ten years and i think if you embrace that it's it's exciting and it can actually bring a little bit of relief i always feel like this is a little bit of a sidebar, but I always feel like the realization that nobody knows what they're doing is when yes. you really become an adult. Yes. Yep. You know, like that's the moment, whatever age it is, the, yeah. that like that's the moment you cross over in, into the realization. And then the next step, which hopefully is freeing, is that, well, if nobody else knows what's going on, then I'm free to do whatever I want to do. Right. Right. Yeah. And um, I, it, that's a hard concept, I think, for people to, <laughs> to accept sometimes. <laughs> right. Well, it I mean, is. We, grow up, yeah. we grow up with teachers telling us what to do all the time, right? It's that's not, right. That's what we're, hey, go to this class, go to that, do this assignment. You know, how do we break out of that? And that follows us into our working lives too. You know, I think that's where, and, and even for me, that was a bit of a hard switch was going from this employee mindset and again like working really hard showing up all the time to do for for whatever somebody else has, has set out for me to do to that shift of an entrepreneur where you're really you're answering to yourself and you don't have those restrictions or parameters in place so i think that mindset it's it can carry over to us for for a long time so how did you make that shift since, I mean, you, you had to go through it and it's not, I think I, you know, heard you on the, the podcast I've listened to you um, mm. talk about, you know, the shift with COVID where everybody's at home now. And, and that's, that's a perspective where it's like, you have to shift. It's, it's simply, that's the way you things do. are versus it, as I understand it, your situation where 
you consciously made this decision to make that shift. So how, yep. how do you go through that, that kind of motion? And it's, it's not to kind of equate it to what you, you hear with companies, but it is that idea of pivoting. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of companies, if something's not working well, they're not going to keep going and be stubborn about it. They're going to pivot and they're going to try new things and they're going to take chances. And I did have, when I was kind of going through that period of, of self-discovery, when I was realizing, oh, you know what, I, I think I'm meant to be doing something else, at least for now. It really was just giving into that idea of, okay, how can I not force, um, just like force how things are the way they are and keep that status quo, but how can I pivot and lean into something that's, that's a little bit different? Um, and so I just, I, I was trying different things, you know, and it's still, it's always a process of experimentation. Um, mm -hmm. Even in my business now, it's all the time. It's how can I just improve? How can I change? How can I adapt? How can I, you know, given the needs of what my clients are, given the needs of what my business is, it's, it's, you're always pivoting. Um, so I think, what happened with me was I started to just listen in to myself uh, and listen to what felt right and was more in my gut rather than, again, what my brain was telling me. And so how I made that switch was I just, I explored it. So when I realized I had never thought of myself as like a teacher or a coach, but then when I got that bug and was starting to be more curious about it. I just followed that curiosity. So I talked to teachers. I talked to coaches. I explored where I could express that more. And so that was really how I made that shift. And that was something that's continued with me today, where it's just, instead of forcing something, it's really exploring it and trying to see like, okay, for example, if I'm afraid of making a change in my business, let me get curious about that and let me just see what that's trying to tell me and where can I explore that and pursue that further. So I think it's really just like leaning into that curiosity and, um, and just trying it out and knowing that you might hit on the right answer. It might be a dead end, but either way, it's, it's okay. I, you know, you kind of touched on having a, having a fear about that change. i I feel like that's the main motivator that holds us back from making that change is, is that fear. There's some kind of nagging anxiety inside of us in, in our chest where we're like, uh, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm more comfortable with where I am. You know, I, I talk about this or ask a guest about this on occasion. Um, there's the, I'll call it a parable, but um, about dog that's lying on the nail and he's, He's mm -hmm. uncomfortable, but not uncomfortable enough to move. And that's what I equate it to where it's like something's wrong, but we're afraid that it's going to be even more painful if we go somewhere that's right. else. Whereas that's right. it's more like the rest of the deck that the dog's laying on is completely open. There's no more nails. If you just move, like it would be smooth <laughs> yeah. sailing. Obviously that's not, you know, perfectly true. Sometimes you run into another nail, but it, it, I, it always just, I, I wish I could will people forward sometimes when they're, when you can see that they're sitting on the nail and they haven't yet found the proper motivation internally to get off of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, I, I, I always love that analogy. And I sometimes use that with people I'm talking with is that the one that I use is, is a fly that you see and it's hitting against the wall, but they don't realize that the open window is right, right next, next to it. where that fly is, is hitting into the window. Um, and I also, the thing is sometimes we do think we have to deal with the discomfort. Um, and a lot of times people don't change until the pain becomes greater right. than what they can tolerate. Right. Um, but the thing is, like, if you acknowledge that change and growth is going to be a little bit uncomfortable too, then you're going to be a little bit more accepting into taking those chances. Um, and so I think it, you, you, the one idea that I always kind of follow is, like, you're going to have to be 
comfortable getting uncomfortable. Right. Um, I even honestly, to tie it into running, it's sort of like when I talk with an athlete or someone who wants to jump up and maybe do a marathon for the first time. Training for a marathon, first of all, anyone can do it. So I <laughs> sometimes when people say like, I could never do that, that's total crap. You right. know, anybody can do it. You just have to put in the work. But you have to get a little bit uncomfortable. If you're lifting, if you are trying to become more powerful, more fit, even if you're trying to lose weight, whatever your goal is when it comes to fitness or with running or whatever it might be, if you want to achieve that new goal, you're going to have to accept that there's going to be a little bit of discomfort. Mm -hmm. But if the end result is more worth it for you to step into that discomfort, you'll, you'll put in the work, you'll put in the effort. So it really is just acknowledging and accepting that there's going to be a little bit of maybe growth, discomfort, and pain. The thing I always struggle with is, how, you know, trying to get inside like the mental mechanisms of people and, and trying to see and figure out, you know, where is that switch? Because as you mentioned, mm -hmm. oftentimes people aren't motivated until the discomfort is great enough that they decide to move. But there's also the times when people are motivated by a positive outcome rather than avoiding a negative. Although I think we tend towards avoiding negative things versus chasing positive things. It's, it, it, it almost seems mysterious or magical to me, like what that turning point is for people. You know, I'm sure you encounter that in, in, in your professional life since you deal with these kinds of situations. Uh, I would say, I would guess pretty frequently. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, uh, that's totally true is that, you know, the, the fears, the limiting beliefs, like those are things that um, even the most successful people who you think have all, all fit together. Like I loved how you were saying earlier, you're just like, when you become an adult, you realize nobody knows what they're doing. And <laughs> I just, yeah, it, it's, that's something like when you're, when you're really afraid of something, it's like everybody feels that. So you, you just, you have to acknowledge that. Yeah. Do you have any good examples of, you know, not necessarily like identifying information, obviously, but like clients you've worked with that you've seen kind of struggle and then you've helped them turn the corner or, you know, they've, they've kind of come to this point where they say, you know, enough's enough. Yeah, I think, so I've, I've worked with a lot of people, whether they just, they, they want to improve something or they're in transition and they really want to, um, to, to, to make some sort of positive change. <laughs> and so honestly, it's a lot of my clients who are coming to me and they're just, they're either stressed, they're burned out, they're overwhelmed. I mean, burnout is a huge thing that people, people really deal with. And they don't know where to start. They don't know where it is that they need to make that change, like what it is that they need to do. And so, you know, that's why for, for my work, I help them get moving, really get them started with running because that is something I think that's why running is so great is it really helps you to get uncomfortable immediately and know how to overcome that. So it's something you can actually prove to yourself because sometimes our thoughts, like overcoming those fears, overcoming those limiting beliefs, easier said than done. You know, Those are things that you live with your brain all of the time. <laughs> but if you can train yourself, if you can get a little bit more uncomfortable physically and really try to um, I get more into that mindset of knowing okay, I went out for a run. I felt really, it felt really painful today, but then the next day it didn't feel as painful. Then it can apply to other areas of your life where you can feel like, all right, you know what? I was really, really scared to have that conversation with my boss or with my spouse, or I, you know, there was some, I, I was afraid to sit down and start writing this book. Um, but again, it's like, if you've taken that action going on the run, you're going to be able to overcome some of those fears, those thoughts, and and apply it to other areas of your life and work. You know the the interesting thing is I, and maybe that's how you've arrived at where you are. But 
um, because I think we both started running at a relatively young age, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's, it seems like there's running is really a microcosm of all these other things that we do, right? We, you know, these many challenges, good days, bad days, lethargic days, all these things have parallels in all of our other endeavors in life. Right. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, you mentioned this in the other podcast as well. If you don't like to run, don't run. Like, you know, I, I don't think either of us would say everybody has to run. It's find your thing, you know, find your thing. But it's like, if you go through these motions, and I don't mean phone it in, but like you do these things, you're really training yourself to be a better person. Once you connect all the dots between, you know, getting up at 5 a.m. to run and overcoming other challenges, like doing things you don't necessarily want to do for a greater positive benefit for yourself. Mm -hmm. So is that, I mean, is... Is that philosophy, thinking about that, where you come from, you know, starting running at a young age to now, is that how things kind of came in or, or did you bring them all together in a, in a different fashion? No, you know, I mean, there's always been these moments where I've faced these times when I've needed to really, um, when I again, where I felt maybe more of that pain and I felt like I needed to grow a little bit more. And running was just always something that was just part of my life. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't really tie the two together. Um, And then it was just at a point not not that long ago where I was looking back, just doing some self-reflection and was wondering, you know, these moments like when I was burned out and looking for a career change or when I w- was trying to figure out the answer to something else in my life. And I just recognized that it, I always turned to running in those moments. Um, it, when I needed to really just be more of a clear of mind, when I needed to um, push myself a little bit more, when I also just needed something to distract or to get away from what it was that I was challenged, what I was being challenged by. Mm-hmm. I would always turn to running. And so, and I did notice other people were experiencing that as well. Um, And so that was really, I mean, how it all kind of came together. I, it was just something that I recognized it was um, something that a lot of people, I think they, especially those who are runners, they've experienced some sort of transformation themselves in that Mm -hmm. way. Um, So it really wasn't, it wasn't something that just kind of came naturally. I did have to really think about it, but it was when I realized like what was kind of everything that was tying together these moments when I was needed to grow, needed to challenge myself a little bit more. And it was always running that helped me stay steady and, and come through that. You know, it seems like, you and I and many of the other runners I speak to all have these kind of common experiences with running. And it brings me back to um, the kind of fundamental question of running. Um, Chris McDougall addresses in mm-hmm. his book, Born to Run. So I, yeah, I wonder, are we born to run? You know, you mentioned um, anybody can do it. If anybody wants to run yeah. a marathon, like they can. And, you know, Chris makes a, a pretty good argument that we are all, physiologically built to run um but thinking about you know run to thrive you know you're you're not just talking about the the physicality of it right? yeah I'm talking about the you know the mental side the spiritual side of it so i guess i'll ask you your opinion are we born to run is that is that part of who we are as humans hmm that's an interesting question um are we born to run? You know, I, I don't know. Not everybody is, that's not like, Oh, are we born good? Are we born bad? You know, it's or right. nature versus nurture kind of thing. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't think everybody is. I think, look, I running did not come naturally to me mm-hmm. when I started. It was something I was, you know, overweight. It was like the last thing I loved watching movies in my basement, playing video games, all that kind of stuff. It just, it really didn't come naturally. Um, I think we're all born with a runner's spirit. I think we are all 
born with the potential to grow into something bigger than we think we can be. And I think running can teach you that on a micro level, you know, and that's why I've really kind of tied that together. But I think the lessons that you can learn from the physical act of running is what can help bring you bridge that gap to your ideal self to, to where you are right now. So I, I don't know if we're born to run, but I do think that everybody really is born with that innate spirit of a runner that they can use to have a really strong mind, uh, really have a deeper purpose, and then also just be in, uh, have like a really healthy lifestyle and, and healthy body. And that can look a million different ways. Does not mean you need to be uh, like a razor thin <laughs> marathoner <laughs> athlete, you know, with six pack and all of that kind of stuff. So as long as you have that spirit, you can, you can do anything. Yeah. I actually kind of just addressed, addressed, addressed that in a, in a video I did for, uh, I do a different show and just about running where I talk about running and talking about, you know, should runners be skinny or is there like a perfect mm. weight or anything? It's like, no, maybe there's an optimal weight for you, but there's a lot of different ways that you can reach that like kind of ideal place. But beyond, I will never not have, I will never not have a gut. I mean, like it's (laughs) it's not huge. It's not, you know, but like I can get, I can't get a six pack to save my life. (laughs) I'm glad (laughs) glad somebody else is there. So I I definitely have a a little bit of fat I can lose, but, uh, but historically I, I just can't, I've never had a six pack, you know, other guys I ran with in college, they did, even though I would run faster than them. It just, just always, I was, I say this jokingly, I don't, I don't mean to be uh, insensitive in terms of uh, people that have body image issues, but I always say like I was the fat guy on the team because comparatively speaking, I carry more body fat than all the other guys. um, Yet continue to be one of the fastest. So I like to use myself in some sense as a case study of like, you don't have to be razor thin to be fast, That's right. nor do right. you have to just weigh very little. Um, I talked about that in that episode, but um, <laughs> uh, getting too off track. Uh, uh, I, I did want to ask you more about run to thrive um, because again, you're, you're focusing beyond just the physicality. We're not just coaching, uh-huh. you know, Hey, how do you run a marathon? Like, you can come to me and come to you and come to any number of coaches totally. and help you figure out how to run a marathon. Um, but you know, you're talking about addressing the mind, addressing the spirit. Um, I, I'm and I asked this question a little jokingly cause I've been watching, um, American horror story, but are, are you building a cult here? Or like what, what <laughs> is, <laughs> what is run to thrive? Yeah, it, it's not a cult. Um, <laughs> but really what it is, is it's, helping people become better leaders. So I think running is one of the biggest acts of self-leadership. And really one of the big philosophies that I believe is that you are a leader, whether by choice or by default. And what I mean by that is you don't have to be anointed in order to be a leader in your life. You don't need to be, a, have it entitled. You know, everybody is a leader. Get, and, and everything that you do is an act of self-leadership. Getting out of bed in the morning that's, that's leadership. That's taking leadership. So that's really what, what I'm trying to, to help people with is how to become better leaders in their life, how to become a better leader in their work, uh, in their home, whatever it might be, and just really using running as the vessel in order to do that. And in order to really be that effective leader, uh, you need to have that strong mind, body, and spirit, that deeper purpose. Um, and I think when people find that they are taking more leadership in their life, then they're living their life. They're not living somebody else's. So it really ties back to that. It's like when you feel like you are doing things because you think you have to or because somebody else thinks that you, you should be doing them or you're comparing yourself to other people. You know, I mean, it's, it's, that's what we see a lot in today's world, especially in social media and yeah. just comparing yourself to other people. But when you break away from that and you're like, I'm going to just stay true to who I am and go after what it is that I want, then you really become a leader. 
And so really what Run to Thrive, Coaching on the Run, what it does is, is it really helps people discover how to do that, how to have more of that fulfillment, that success, that energy, engagement, enjoyment in their life. Um, and in all aspects, not just as how to be a better runner, but you know, I really believe that when you do get started running, you are going to experience change uh, for the better in all aspects of your life. So really that's, that's the goal. That's the aim for, for Run to Thrive is really just helping you have more of that fulfillment through being a better leader for yourself and for others. Not to be too cheesy, but tying yeah. it back to uh, uh, entertainment industry, it's like being yeah. the this being the lead character in your own movie, right? Instead of yeah. being yeah. that's right, instead of being a side character, you know, like you are you're the star of your show and what you're doing. Yeah, I was actually I was listening to a podcast, and his whole message was he was saying my whole life I've been Robin seeking out Batman. Mm. And he was not saying that as like, that's what everybody should be doing. He was saying, you know what? I've lived in fear and I've always wanted to do something. Like I've always lived, made my decisions and lived my life based upon what I think is going to be the right decision, what, how it's going to make me look for others. Mm -hmm. But really, instead of being the Robin looking for your Batman, and, and this kind of ties into the pop culture because Batman is my favorite superhero and right. all, I, I love all of that. Um, we need to become but you want to be the you want to be the superhero in your in your own movie because I actually believe that that's one of the analogies that I use with running is you can become the warrior runner you can become a superhero I actually do believe that running gives you a form of superpowers <laughs> that you can use I uh, which if you want to call it being a better leader or just being a superhero running will do that for you right well it's like you know, it, it, in some essence, you can be like, you can write it off and say, okay, that's cheesy. Like, Matt's just a weird guy. He likes comics. Okay, <laughs> who cares? But, you know, it's it, it, different areas strike chords with different people. But this, the imagery, I think, is important because when you just say, be a better leader, it doesn't paint a picture, does it? No. Right? Yeah. You know, when you say, you know, you need to be your own Batman or, or, or whatever. Yeah. You know, we, we know who Batman is. Like we know yep. the character arc. We know, we know all these things and it paints so much more of a, a, a vivid idea of who we should be or who we can be than just saying, be a leader in your own life, you know, be a superhero. Right. That's, that's, that's a big statement. I totally agree. And I, I, you know, what people always, you know, it, it, for anyone who <clears throat> loves and follows superheroes, um, they know that superheroes are flawed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> superheroes are flawed and they have these journeys where either they had tragedy that they had to overcome. Like, yeah, honestly, if you think of any superhero movie or any superhero story, it's not just, hey, I was born with these powers and everything is great, or I was bestowed these powers and now everything is great and amazing. They always have some sort of adversity and they're usually inner demons and outer mm -hmm. demons or inner, inner uh, villains or outer villains, whatever the case may be. And so mm -hmm. I completely agree. You're right. It's like leaders aren't perfect. Um, and so to equate it more with being that superhero, it's more appropriate because... It's going through some of knowing that you have some of this, these struggles that are inside of you and just overcoming it to help yourself and, and for others. Cause that's what superheroes do. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it reminds me too, you know, as you're talking, you remind me uh, of um, Joseph Campbell, who I'm not familiar. No, I don't yep. know if you're familiar. Yeah. So he talks. Oh yeah. The hero's journey. Right. Yeah. He talks all about the hero's journey and it's like, if so, if you listening is not familiar with Joseph Campbell, uh, I know Netflix for a time had his whole like lecture series on there. I don't know if they still have it, but you can find it online. Hmm. And the the great thing about Joseph Campbell's kind of lecture series on the hero's journey is that he's talking about us living our best lives through allegories, stories, parables, all these different like stories humanity tells 
over time that, that regardless of culture seem to mimic each other and try their best to explain our condition as human beings and how to reach mm-hmm. our potential. And, you know, in, in our case, currently with pop culture, you know, superheroes have kind of taken the forefront of being that literal hero's journey, you know, yeah. to become the best version of ourselves. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And it's, it's, I, 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 I love, I talk about that too <laughs> on Run to Thrive. And I talk about that. It, it is about the hero's journey and same thing, you know, the hero's journey you can't have a hero's journey without obstacles in your way. Right. You can't get to blowing up the death star without, um, you know, uh, going into the Sarlacc pit. You can't, uh, (laughs) you can't beat Thanos without half the, the, the world getting snapped into oblivion uh, and then having to figure that out. So it's just like, there's always going to be those challenges that are in your way. Um, and so it's just how willing are you to use your own powers? And that's what I love about the superhero analogy with runners too, is everyone has different powers. Everyone has different strengths. Um, and it's not just physical, you know, it is really that on the mental side, on the spiritual side, all of that. Um, and so it's, how are you going to tap into those, those strengths to overcome those challenges? Okay, Matt. Uh, so you don't run late on your next appointment. Um, I want to ask you, there's a question I'm asking everybody this season. Um, and because of what you do, it seems particularly poignant yeah. for you. Um, I'm asking everybody, what do you think the purpose of sport is? It's a great question. What do I think the purpose of sport? I think it's, I'm going to speak to this on an individual level. Sure. Um, Cause you know, I think, sport we can think about like the purpose it serves for watching it or whatever but for me obviously i'm an active participant i'm an athlete i coach people who are whether they admit it or not any runner is an athlete whether you go out for for once or not i agree i think the purpose of sport and particularly for something like runner like running it is to discover something else about ourselves um, that we might not see otherwise. Um, and so really the purpose is for us to be able to grow personally, to discover those powers, those superpowers, <laughs> um, and also to push ourselves to live life to the fullest. And so that's why I say it's on an individual level. I think the purpose of it is really to help us become a better version of who we already are. And for me, I believe running can do that. I believe a lot of other sports, whatever it is for you, that's what you should do. Um, But I think having that that sport and and really um, uh, embracing it um, and also engaging in it, it's it can teach you more. It can can teach you more about yourself than you ever thought possible. Good answer. Matt, if people want to get in touch with you, see what you're up to, connect, any of that kind of stuff, where can they find you? Yeah, so you can go to coachingontherun.com. That's the name of my my company. Um, on there, if you, you sign up, you can get a whole Jumpstart Your Running Toolkit, which has a running plan, a running journal, a guided run. Uh, it's a really cool, a really cool uh, package that you can get. Um, also, I... Uh, Instagram at coaching on the run, uh, Facebook at coaching on the run, and then also um, listen and subscribe to run to thrive. That's on all major podcast platforms. Sounds, Sounds good. Thanks for hanging out with me today, Matt. It's been great. I appreciate you having me on.